All right, let's go ahead and give our guest a call. Hi. Hi, is this Bruce? Yes. All right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor, he is a teacher, and he even is a producer, if you consider his son, who he produced and gave us for the entertainment field. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Mr. Bruce Glover. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hi, Tiffany. I'd like to say it's not only a pleasure to have one of my favorite actors on the show, but somebody who uh, is from my hometown back in the Illinois era. You're from Chicago. You bet. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's up city, up city, and it, it's part of the reason why I've been able to uh, develop the ability to be in a very tough business. Yeah. And uh, to, well, also a certain amount of talent. Not everyone can go into this business. It's a very dangerous thing to try to become an actor, and people get taken advantage of, and they deal in their own fantasies of what it should be and uh, not getting what it should be. And uh, one of the things that uh, I had to do as, uh, as a kid, I started working when I was six years old. I made 10 cents a day wow. for six uh, delivering groceries. And uh, I never didn't have a job. My father brought me down to the Loop in Chicago, and um, I did deliveries for him in areas that uh, were scary for an, you know, a seven-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And I would, you know, get on trains and elevators, elevated and all of that stuff and be all over. And then I got a job down the street from my father's jewelry store. He was really a wash repairer uh, at a newsstand, and I made a dollar a day, so wow. I was getting rich. <laughs> yeah, and for all of that, you had to freeze in the winter time and roast in the summertime. Chicago is the greatest city in the world, except for the weather. You know, there's like six good weather weeks in the whole year. <laughs> you, you never know when they're going to happen, and uh, being on the newsstand in the winter uh, was a uh, you know you're lifting bundles of, of papers and uh, you're trying to stay warm and uh, sometimes I would sneak into the drugstore where I could look out the window at the newsstand to see mm -hmm. that nobody was stealing newspapers. You know, you so was, I was Go ahead. I was in the news on that newsstand all the way during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I, I survived basically um, the, um, you know, the... the the sadness of everyone being out of work and, right. uh, and the war starting. And, but I always worked, and uh, I didn't not enjoy it, strangely. I think you need to enjoy whatever you're doing. Find something that you can do, just enjoying your own ability to handle a new task, whether I'm gardening or mowing lawn or putting up windows or digging graves. I did all of those things. You, you dug graves? Yeah, I dug graves. Wow. Wow. And I uh, worked with my grandfather, who was a Swedish carpenter, and uh, worked with him with remodeling, and I dug ditches, and I, uh, you know, I, I did everything. And um, But I had a, an ability for art and a, an ability for sports. I was a good, active kind of dude. And uh, those were the things that kind of kept me going. But in that neighborhood that I was in, I don't know how... It, I'm older than you are, so it was an entirely different environment. My environment was a tough guy neighborhood. And yeah. if you didn't look like a tough guy, you were in trouble. So I remember I would... My mother would dress me in knickers, and as soon as I left the house, I would pull the knicker, knickers down to my ankles. <laughs> and then uh, I would dress in such a way that I look like a tough guy yeah. and I learned to talk like tough guys did so we all had these dems and those accents if you didn't talk like that you weren't a tough guy so you, you had to be <laughs> one of the east side kids one of the Bowery boys 
Well, it, <clears> you know, it it was different in Chicago. I mean, this is I was in west west uh, northwest side of Chicago, and uh, you know, I went to Scherz High, and I played football on their team, and I was uh, we took the city championship in 1949 and wow. I was one of the on that team and that really contributed to that championship. We played in Soldier Field in front of, you know, 100,000 people, which was extraordinary for those times. Well, even in the 70s, mm-hmm. I remember uh, we went <clears throat> excuse me, went to an Elvis Presley concert and we got lost and we wound up in the wrong side of town and the police escorted us out because they said, you're going to die <laughs> if you stay here. So it, it was rough, yeah. Well, well, there was uh, a lot of times, you know, I mean, there still was some of it. There there was that division of black and white, and the south side was considered the black side, and the white was the north side. But as a kid, I remember having to make deliveries into all black areas, and it was an education. Um, I remember getting on a streetcar and heading south on it on State Street, and as the couple of blocks there were no white people left on the streetcar it was just blacks and i was the only white person there a little eight-year-old kid and they the kindest it got was they didn't look at me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the ones who looked at me looked at me with pure hatred and i understood it because i i i could understand now what it must have felt sometimes for blacks coming into a white neighborhood right so I had a, I always had a good rapport with, uh, I remember there was a black coal delivery guy who uh, used to deliver coal, who was, you know, and I remember being able to make jokes with him, and, and the first time I ever saw him was like three years old. I remember running at him going, look, mom, a black man. Oh. <laughs> he laughed and put out his hands, and we had... But th- that same man, I eventually worked with him delivering coal myself. Right. right. And I and I in those days we didn't even have wheelbarrows. We had sacks, and you had to shovel the coal into sacks, put them up on your shoulder, carrying it down a sidewalk to the coal chute, and pour it in through the coal chute. So hopefully. If we get a new president, we can get rid of coal, and <laughs> I won't have to do that job. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> let me ask you, Bruce, because, I mean, you obviously, you know, came from the working class, and, and you ended up breaking out of that, but I want you to tell us, I had read a story online, and you can tell me if it's true or not, but your kind of first foray in breaking into being considered or considering yourself an actor involved a, a gorilla suit? Well... Yeah, but i got to <laughs> tell you, I had an instinct for acting, and I didn't know what it was. So in our tough working-class neighborhood, if you said you were an actor, that was like being, I'm going to be a girl and wear a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't allow that. I had an instinct for it. I remember my mother, my dear mother, used to read Little Women to me and take me to movie theaters, which my father forbade because it was against the religion to be in a movie theater, but I was infatuated with movies. But I remember seeing a newsreel with FDR struggling to get to a microphone with his polio. Right. And and uh, I remember showing my mother stuff that I saw at the movie theater with her sometimes, and I showed her FDR. And what I showed her was I put my body into a polio body. And in a sense, then I was able to walk, and I remember my mother looking at me with astonishment. She was, "Do you love your president?" I, 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 yeah, yeah, I guess so. But what I was interested in was what is happening with that person, right? And that's what acting should be about, instead of the dumb things that people are taught by dumb teachers who failed at acting themselves. And the majority of people who teach. Uh, teach the same dumb stuff that caused them to be failures. Right. And uh, so I, I taught, I, I teach very different things. But what I'm saying is, acting should be an exploration of the experience. So if I title what I teach, 
it would be called experiential acting. If you're not having an experience, you're not doing anything interesting. And and that goes for art, too, because I am also a painter, and I'm working on my art book right now. Fantastic. But I took, I took a long journey towards being an actor, so you just didn't do it. But I had an instinct for it, and I remember, like, being in a church group uh, and being put on a in a play up at the front of the church, or a small church, and it was Joseph and Mary going from door to door to find a, trying to find a place so that they could give birth and shelter to Jesus. <laughs> 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 and but, they went from one person to another, and I was the youngest person on the thing, and I was only like three years old. And they got to me, and my one line was, no room at the inn. And I mean, I was just a little barrel-chested kid, and I burst out with no room in here. <laughs> you wanted to be heard. Whole, you didn't need a microphone. There you go. The whole church burst into laughter. So I, <laughs> so, so I did it again, and I did it again, and finally the minister was chasing me around the altar as I kept repeating that line. And I was carried down the aisle and locked down in the basement. <laughs> I was still yelling, no room at the inn. So they, the acting thing, I enjoyed it. Now, becoming an actor, like I said, was only the fruity boys were allowed to be actors. Right. And not that I dislike fruity boys. I have many friends who were fruity boys. <laughs> well, it wasn't wasn't such a fruity job getting to throw the, the stripper around as, as the gorilla. I mean, is that literally what you did? You had to pick her up, throw her around? Well, let's get to that in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'll tease you a little bit, let you wait to see if that story is true. Okay. <laughs> well, I like your philosophy of acting because I noticed when we moved out here, uh, there there's so many con artists out here that, that sell acting classes or the, the headshot scam and everything. And, and oh. you know, and, and you really got to watch that, don't you? Well, the headshot thing is one of the worst things because you don't need to get someone to take your headshot. Take your iPhone or get a friend with an iPhone and take your shots. And make jokes while you're taking it, so you'll have expressions where there's thoughts going on in your head instead of this frozen statue that appears on technically pure photography. Forget pure. Yeah. Pure right. is boring. And art shouldn't be pure. Art isn't about not making mistakes. Art, sometimes the mistake is the best thing you did. Right. And you don't realize that right away. But I, I have a very strong, different kind of a thing. But I, as a kid, was, uh, had um, problems with school. And um, because I flunked English my first year of class, and I didn't know, you know, uh, they hadn't taught me how to read. But I would say the lines that I heard somebody else read while looking at the pictures. So I was able to memorize that. And they had me tested and found out I had a really high IQ, but I didn't know. I thought I was always stupid. Mm. And I was actually very, very bright. And uh, I, I didn't realize I was very, very bright until um, I was in, like, I don't know, sixth grade, and the teacher brought us into the school library, and she said, all right, all the class can go to wall one, two, and three, and Bruce and Irene, or maybe it was Tiffany, who knows, <laughs> Bruce and Tiffany, and go to wall four, which were all the college level books, and I immediately went there and took out Homer's The Iliad and The Odyssey. And uh, But at that moment when the teacher said that, I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I'm not the dumb one, I'm the smart one. Right, yeah. right. And uh, for years, it was still there. There was a, a kind of brain that I have that people didn't even know existed. And I... Um, played football, I was uh, given a scholarship offer to Colorado College, but they wouldn't let me in until I went to a college because they'd seen a grade that I plunked in, probably with math or something like mm -hmm. that. And then I went to a junior college in Chicago and played two years there and played semi-pro football on Sundays. Now, this is way before acting happened, but I remember, like, doing wrestling contests, and I worked in a carnival in a wrestling sequence where I 
would challenge the guy from the audience, and it was kind of like acting, but I didn't know I was. But I still had the D's, Dems, and Do's accent. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I I played for two years and uh, semi pro, and all, and suddenly, and I took that test to stay out of being drafted for the Korean War, mm-hmm. and I passed the test, but then I flunked English. And I flunked English three times in a row, and that got me drafted for the Korean War. Mm. Now, the Korean War, uh, I was there the last six months of the actual shooting part of the war, and it was an interesting experience. The Koreans are terrific people, and I learned a lot. But when the war stopped, University of California started sending teachers over to Seoul, Korea, to give courses. So I picked up nine hours of college credits when I was mm. in Korea. Korea. And one of the courses I figured I'd better take was English. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He had a reason now. That got me drafted over there. And I took the course, and at the end of the course, the teacher, a very kind, you know, uh, University of California teacher, pulled me aside and said, Bruce, I don't know what it is about you, but there's something strange. He said, by going by your grammar scores and all that, I should flunk you again. But you write beautifully. He had given out writing assignments, and Mm -hmm. I'd written three short stories, which he felt were... He said, you have have really great talents. And I'd read a lot of them, so I I didn't have to learn. Just read read good stuff. You like to be a good artist? Look at good art. You want to see good actors? Look at good actors. You want to you want to be good at something? Look at somebody who's good at them and appreciate what they're doing. Don't try to imitate what they're doing. Just appreciate them. Mm-hmm. So he said, I don't know what it is about you, but there's something strange in your brain, and you do things. And but I'm going to pass you just to get this over with. Well, at that point, nobody knew what it was. What was wrong with my brain was this: I'm dyslexic. Oh, okay. Wow. wow. So dyslexia, and my theory of dyslexia is, yeah, there's dumb dyslexic and smart <laughs> dyslexic. You know, we have talked to so many actors that were dyslexic. It seems yep. to go hand in hand, yeah. Which actors were dyslexic that you talked to? Well, John Mallory Asher from Weird Science, son of William Asher, was one. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's been, there's been quite a few. I don't even remember all of them. Right. Well... Here it is with me, and I, I, I went on and got a master uh, science of, uh, I got a science, a um, bachelor of science in uh, speech with a minor in psychology, and I wanted to study psychology anyway because um, everyone I knew in my life was crazy, you know what I mean? So I wanted <laughs> to. <laughs> and I guess in a certain way I was crazy, but I knew how to use it. And, uh, you know, like I knew how to, um, I was a pretty good fighter, so I, I didn't have to keep pushing the, my ankles down, uh, my stuff down to my ankles to look like a tough guy. And, but I still had the D's, Dems, and Do's accent. Let me ask you but this, could, as an actor and as a father, because I had an opportunity to talk to Bruce Dern, and I, I talked to him about how things were different when he was an actor compared to Laura Dern when she was growing up, uh, how did this relate with with your son? I mean, you had it rough, but I assume he had it a little easier growing up. And how did that come yeah. into play? Well, one of the things that uh, I did as an actor, well, yeah, Laura is terrific, by the way. Oh, yeah. She and work together, and Bruce Dern is a terrific, terrific actor and yes. guy, and I, I, I've enjoyed my meetings with him a few times at events, which are over with now until the COVID goes yeah. away. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, so Laura, you know, is a very bright and very beautiful woman, and very sweet, and uh, the times I've been at events and talked to her has always been a great pleasure, and she always sends a great congratulations to Crispin. But one of the things that I, you know, with the dyslexic is I believe dyslexia for me was don't find out how to do it, just do it. Yeah. Right. Don't, if you have an instinct for something, the danger for most people is they don't find their instinct. 
and they end up doing something that they're supposed to do because mommy and daddy chose it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there you are with Kristen. Kristen's terrific mother, my dear wife, who we had a 46, 56 plus year marriage, and I lost her four years ago. Oh, which, sorry. You know, both Crispin and I miss her terrifically. But she took him to schools very early. She took him to Montessori when he was young. And oh, she, yeah. She eventually got him uh, uh, um, to the Montessori school. And uh, and she, she, you know, which was, you had to take gifted uh, program uh, tests that you had to be in it. So he was in a gifted school program. But uh, at one point when uh, he had finished junior high, basically, he'd had one summer where he went to a regular junior high thing during a summer course. And I thought it was time for him to get out of the elite thing and realize that there was a world out there which was dangerous. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things I, I always did with Crispin was I, I started talking to him before he was born. I used to put my mouth on my wife's tum tum and talk to him. Say, "Hi, this is your daddy. I can't <laughs> wait to." <laughs> and I think everyone should do that. Yes. If you have a baby on the way, talk to the baby now, so the baby won't be so confused when it comes out and look around and go, "Where the hell am I?" <laughs> you, know? you know, I didn't do that, but like the other host here is my daughter. And, and I never talked to her baby talk. You know how parents always talk to their kids' baby talk? I never did that. No. Well, uh, I only talk to him baby talk now. Because I'm his <laughs> he's the boss. He thinks he knows more than me now. No, he's <laughs> true. <laughs> but, uh, no, I used to talk to him, and uh, I used to say, um, you know, I would walk up and down Broadway and point at signs and things, and I'd say, what do you think that is? What do you think that is? And I used to take him to the park and and watch how brave he was. He would stride along Riverside Park. Uh, we were on an upper west side um, by the time uh, he was, well, he was born when I was still on the lower east side in New York. And uh, the New York thing is a whole different phase of life. Now, so, yeah, uh, uh, Bruce probably was, uh, he's lucky, his daughter is smart, uh, he's, uh, um, Crispin was smart but one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to put Crispin in situations which he could just be challenged by and one of the things I decided he should get into sports a little bit and um, I knew that he wasn't like a football type like me um, but I knew that he could handle so I, I put him into soccer there was AYSO soccer mm-hmm. And I put him to, into soccer, and I, he was playing on these kids' teams. And eventually, uh, that worked out for me because somebody, a couple dudes, one was an English guy, and the other guy was Scottish, and said, Well, what kind of st- a soccer team? And we like you to be on it. And I went, Well, I never played soccer. No, but you look strong, and you look like I could do it. <laughs> They put the, they put together this terrible team, and I played on it. And the team was put into a league and was kicked out immediately. It was supposed to get two games with every, and it was kicked out after just one. But I had fallen in love with soccer, and I used to go. I live across the street from a park, and mm-hmm. uh, Marvista Playground, a rec park. And the Argentinians, classic team, used to come over there and practice even when the you know, Olympics were going on. But there were Argentinians and Mexicans and lots of South Americans playing every Saturday from like, I don't know, 8 in the morning to 8 at night as long as there was light. And there could be as many as 100 people on each side. And each person that would arrive, they'd say, okay, you're on that team and then we're, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever. And I remember standing on the side there watching them and some guy looked over at me and he, he gave me my first nickname in that soccer room. He says, hey! movie <laughs> oh wow you want to play <laughs> <laughs> I said yeah so I, I went and played and I played with them for quite a while but movie meaning that he had probably never seen any of my movies he had yeah. probably only seen um, 
television shows like Chips. I saw you in Chips. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've, I've got to ask you, okay, there's many actors that came out of Chicago and the area. I mean, Jodie Foster, you know, came from my town. I was born in Rockford, Illinois. But how did you get from Chicago to Hollywood and into the film industry? Well, okay, here we go. So I, um, before I went to Korea, uh, I used to work out with weights for my athletic stuff, and I even worked out with one guy who was a Mr. America, mm -hmm. and um, they that uh, somebody said, you know, you've got a good, one of my buddies said, hey, you've got a good build on, you ought to go down there and pose at the Art Institute. He and I had been doing art projects in my yard and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I went down to pose at the Art Institute in Chicago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I was posing. There was a beautiful naked woman posing across the room. And uh, we had, we were, we were, were jockstraps, so we didn't have to expose all of our inadequacies. Uh, <laughs> oh, the my. Women, <laughs> the women were delightfully naked and uh, I remember seeing this girl and she came to me at the break uh, with her bathrobe on now and uh, darn it and then she said Bruce how would you like to and then she kind of rolled her eyes at me and my mind was going because I'd seen her <laughs> naked and I was thinking like to like to and she said be a gorilla and all your dreams were dashed because you were hoping for more and come to find out you were offered bananas. Well, I thought, what the hell is this? Some kind of new sex ritual? Or what? <laughs> and it turned out that she was a stripper. Oh. And she, the, the guy who had been the gorilla part of the act, it was a fairly famous gorilla act that had been in the Chicago World's Fair. And the guy who ran the act was also an agent for other strippers and owned this act. And uh, I went in to meet him. He says, "Yeah, you you should uh, you should do this act and um, go down to the Lincoln Park Zoo and uh, meet Bushman." And so I went down to the Lincoln Park Museum uh, Zoo, which uh, had a, a gorilla house, and mm -hmm. they had chimpanzees and other gorillas and uh, I think they had one orangutan and then there was Bushman down at the end he had a double cage and he was huge he was like 500 pounds and I walked down there and the people who had, who had been there had disappeared and suddenly I was the only person that was standing in front of a gorilla this famous gorilla and he looked at me and then he said Bruce don't tell anyone I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, Bushman. He said, now, you're going to be a gorilla. Here's what you got to do. <laughs> Think my thoughts. I went, okay, Bushman. Then he said, do my moves. I said, okay, Bushman. <clears throat> He said, that's your lesson. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, Bushman. So I went back, and we rehearsed the act, and it was, you know, it was like 15 minutes of the girl coming out and stripping and me coming out and scaring the audience and then me chasing the girl and then her scaring me off and then me hiding and catching my breath behind her and then her dancing and then finally me catching her on an altar and she commits suicide after I've <clears> raped her and then I carry her off and that was it. So um You you can't we, you can't see shows like that anymore. You know, it's sad. That's entertainment. <laughs> well it was. I don't know that <laughs> I think it's coming back, frankly. Oh, okay. I think there are, I think there's some burlesque coming back and there's some big acts with women jumping out of cakes and things like that which is but i you know i so i i um we went down to florida tampa bay florida and we had like i don't know eight week job down there and it was a good pile of money much more than the six dollars i made a week on the newsstand mm. right. and more than i made in the glass factory. i worked in a glass factory for two years too and from 14 15 and uh there i was ladling hot glass but here I am in the ape suit, 
And the, the clubs in those days were more like burlesque in a way. They would have a stand-up comedian, and the strippers were kind of very classy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and they, uh, mm-hmm. but there were girls would go around and get people to buy drinks and stuff like that. But um, so there was this magician. He was a magician act in in the in the club as part of the entertainment, and he pulled me aside and in front of bunch of people in the dressing room and he said Bruce and he took out his magic wand and he tapped me on each shoulder and on the forehead he said you are an actor wow and that was it I said what do you mean he said you make that gorilla so believable you ought to try and act it right. he said really and then there was this big guy who was a singer in a nightclub again quite a varied entertainment strippers and kind of burlesque like and magicians and this singer and this big tall handsome guy who I got to know for years um, said yeah you ought to go to New York and take acting classes I went acting classes he said yeah I said there are classes in acting he said yeah you, you take acting classes I, just, I went oh okay I, I still don't believe in acting classes even though I teach in a sense what I teach as a therapist rather than as a teacher like most of these teachers but uh, so I then got drafted for the Korean War, and uh, the whole time I was there, uh, uh, I was you know lucky to never get shot or killed, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, and survived it and got my uh, English score and passed English, and I could go back to to Chicago, and then maybe. I could get my scholarship at Colorado College, which also had a good art school. And I liked the idea of going there. Um, and I went back, but I went back to the college where I played football for to pick up some more classes while I put out my feelers for getting a scholarship again. And then I was there and I saw on a notice that there was auditions for a play. And I thought, huh, maybe I should see if that magician was right and go try out for that play. <laughs> right. Just on that and recommendation. I, yeah, and so I went down there and uh, read, and the teacher, who was uh, the director of this play, was, it was Camino Real, Tennessee Williams' play, who I later did his Broadway show and got to know him pretty well. Mm-hmm. But... Um, so the, my first play was Camino Real. Now, I didn't know I was going to get to play. I just read, and then the teacher said, okay, come back to the callback Saturday. And I went, okay, and I didn't go back. Maybe it was some kind of sudden fear. I found some other way of being busy with something else. I was setting up more posing classes at the Art Institute so I could make m- money for my college, and I had the GI Bill, but... Uh, you know, whatever. The more money you could bring in, and eventually, and I didn't go back. And I'm walking down the hall and up a flight of stairs, and I see this teacher running at me, and he says, "Where were you?" I go, "Where?" Were you? He said, "You didn't come back to the callback." I said, "No, I got a little busy." He says, "I, I, I want you to play the lead." Mm. Wow. <laughs> and I went, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah." <laughs> And the magician okay. was right. And it was Kilroy and Camino Real, which had a lot of a variety to it. It was humorous. It, uh, I danced in it. I had a girlfriend that was a dancer and taught me some steps and all that stuff. And I did. The, I was doing the play. And then somebody said, you ought to do community theater. And I did some community theater. I sang in a Wagnerian opera. And uh, I did Ken, Arthur Miller and other plays and community theater and the most most uh, the actors in those community theaters were the most pompous actors I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yeah, then you very self-important you know like oh my god but then somebody told me about a summer stock company up in Wisconsin up mm-hmm. a, a little branch off of Lake Geneva and it was an old Mormon church and uh, they said go on up there and uh, they uh, hire three actors and I I 
wrote them a letter, and they'd already hired the three actors, actors, but they had open casting. So I went up there for open casting. I drove up in my car, and I got the lead in the first play, and I had a lead in every other play, and I had very little money. And I basically lived out of my car and slept on the porch of the theater. Wow. <laughs> you definitely Doing fought the hard road, that's for sure. But you certainly... Well, you certainly got there. I, I mean, I think a lot of your your upbringing in Chicago and, and being the tough kid or having to at least act like the tough kid caused you to get a lot of roles like that. I know you're really famous for your role in Diamonds Are Forever as, as Mr. Wint, and, and James Bond is a big thing here. Can, can you talk about how you got in into that movie and what that experience was like? I, I guess that was uh, Sean Connery, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, great, great, yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, it's a widespread of things, you know. I mean, getting into that, and I'll get to that about okay, sure. guy, how it happens. And uh, that wasn't a tough guy, by the way. It was two uh, males who were basically married. Mm. So it, that was a very, very audacious and daring thing for the time that was out. Right. Uh, that these two gay guys were the murderers and the thing, and very clever. But my, so anyway, I, I I decided during that summer, like, the hell with football, this is it, I'm going to be an actor. So I flushed the idea of being a football player, and I went to Northwestern University. And um, by the time I got to Northwestern, I'd already done more plays than anyone who was taking classes there. Mm -hmm. So I knew more about the re actuality of doing a play. So you would do a new play every week. And you would get, you know, basically five days to get ready to perform a play. And that, to me, is like one of the greatest experiences in my life. I did over 100 summer stock plays. Yeah. And I did Broadway, and I did Off-Broadway, and I did touring, and I did all of that. That's one of the advantages that most actors don't get today, where they can do a lot of theater. Absolutely, that's uh, true, very true, yeah. And most of the people who do theater now are so bad at that, uh, that they teach them how to be theatrical instead of a real human being. Now, when I did a play, I could go one week and be an 18-year-old, next week be a 60-year-old, one week be a smart guy, one week a dumb guy, one week a funny guy. And so i that's why the variety, if you look at my roles and you look at my demo, you'll see that I have, uh, I've never done the same character twice. I mean, everyone should do, and I don't do myself. I, this this is me right now, but it, that you've never I've never put this on screen. I, I mean, it's a lot so, more fun being a character actor, I would assume, you know, that you get to be so many different people. Everyone should be called a character actor. I mean, all that thing is a way of diminishing it. You're not a star, you're just a character actor. Yeah. Well, in a way, it's kind of true, uh, because um, they like to call you a character actor, but you're really the, maybe the, the fiber of the whole movie, because mm -hmm. you're, you know, that, those actors who are really real give, you know, people that sometimes the star is just a star because they're gorgeous and... Yeah. Uh, great boobs or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay, too. <laughs> but whatever it takes to get there. But uh, I I did um, another year and three quarters at Northwestern, and um, but I did another summer of stock after that where I did repertory theater. And, you know, I, I, I just finally knew I had to go to New York and that's a scary place to go to but you have to jiggle around, go from place to place and be brave but I'll tell you one of the things that Northwestern did for me doing Shakespeare you can't do speak to speech I pray you, speak to speech I pray you, is I pronounce it to you, you gotta actually enunciate correctly mm -hmm. so I lost my D's, Dems and Do's yeah. back then and the best thing about Northwestern was it, it, it went. One of the things that I did at Northwestern, I developed a reputation because I'd be in class and make comments, and I was starting to teach privates to people back then because they saw that I was telling them the truth. 
I, I, in a way, I knew more about the reality of acting than a lot of the teachers there. Not that the teachers weren't loving and giving and helpful, but there was this one young guy came to me and he said, Bruce, I, 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 I heard about you and I, I, I want you to come and see my my freshman um, scene and give me your comments on it. I'm like, sure, and I went. And he was pretty good in the thing. And then uh, I went up and there was like a line of about 50 girls lined up to congratulate him. So I got up there front in the first because I knew that I couldn't wait till all these girls who wanted to take him to bed because uh, <laughs> he was a gorgeous kid and um, so I got up there and I, I said that was great and uh, thank you and he said no wait hang don't, hang by let me get rid of all these people and again all these people were girls who wanted him mm-hmm. and uh, so we walked around the campus and he said so how was I and I said you were pretty good here and I said you could have done this and that but you're fine and he said well what should I do I said about what he said should I stay at college or should I go to New York I said what do you want he says, I want to be a star. Mm-hmm. Now, years later, <laughs> when I told this story in front of this guy and one of his kids, he got mad at me by saying, I didn't say I want to be a star. <laughs> 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 but he did say it back then. But at any rate, uh, I got to New York about six months after he had gone, gone to New York because he took my advice. He went to New York. And I'm walking down Fifth Avenue and I see this the guy coming at me and he gives me a big hug a big tall gorgeous guy and he says Bruce you were right I'm a star I said that's great Warren it's Warren Beatty oh (laughs) yeah wow (laughs) yeah and he you know he was terrific and it it was surprising to me that Warren Beatty would ask advice from anyone didn't he have a pretty good ego well, he was only 19 then. He well, was still I <laughs> <laughs> we all start out humble. Always. Right. He has a terrific ego, but he's a lovely guy, you know, and his, his lovely, br- br- brilliant, talented wife. And he, you know, he's he's great, and his wife is great. And uh, so the, I, I bumped into each of them a few times at events and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, so... Warren Warren uh, was looking for good advice, and I had a somehow my reputation had been passed around the school of speech, and uh, so uh, it it you know I, what I do as a teacher is I see where you are, mm-hmm. and I ask the question, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want to do? And if you that's kind of like a, a good psychologist approach because I kind of approach teaching as a psychologist in a way. What do you want? What are you doing? And how is that preventing you from getting what you want? Yeah. Now, if you want this, here are some things you might do to get what you want. That's what I teach and how I teach. And if somebody wants to... Um, take online lessons because I won't see anyone in person anymore and I stopped having group classes and I started just doing privates and even that I won't do anymore until this COVID is over uh, but I'll do online stuff and they I will give a two hour online private online spread over whatever amount of time it takes for $150 so mm-hmm. if somebody wants to be in contact with me, they have to call this number that I'm going to give you. Okay. And it's 310-398-2539. Now, if they leave a proper message, it sounds like they're not insane, because I get lots of insane <laughs> calls. And, it's so, and they leave a, a good phone number where they don't uh, pronounce the two or three the same way <laughs> <laughs> but a clear enunciated phone number I will call them back and talk with them and then when I decide that they, if they want to do it I'll tell them how to get the money to me and then I'll start working with them and I'll give them short, short monologues and uh, tell them how to work on it but I'll tell them how to do self photos you know instead yeah. of all that other stuff a lot of stupid money and then they 
I will give them short monologues, then they will shoot themselves on an iPhone or with a friend's iPhone and send it back to me to my post, you know, to my Facebook, which I'll give them when, once we're involved. And I'll look at it and I'll tell them how terrible they were. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or I might, you know, give them a few suggestions and stuff and start moving them towards simple things. Look like a human being. Talk like a person talking to a person. That's the way you should do it. Don't take lessons with me. Just do what I just said. Yeah. Now, just have you it. have you ever had this situation, Bruce? Because we've talked to a lot of people uh, who teach acting, and some of them are very uh, credentialed and should be teaching acting. And then some of them are like you said at the start of this interview, to where they're a failed actor. So that's what they're teaching because they couldn't. Not that's not the case with you, but no, have you, you ever you have credits? Have, a lot of them don't even have any credits. Have you ever had a situation because everybody wants to everybody wants to be an actor, everybody wants to come to California or go to New York, and everybody wants to be famous. But sometimes I'm sure people have it in them, and sometimes I'm sure maybe they don't. Have you ever had a situation to where you've told a student, you know, maybe you should pursue something else? I mean, what do you do in that situation? <laughs> what do you do, Bruce? And has anybody oh. you've ever told that you shouldn't be an actor wound up becoming famous? Because that's happened, too. No. I, I Look, I take every person as an individual. But I tell them about their logistics and their age and their physicality. And, you know, I test them. I, I see if they have a potential for comedy or if they're uh, able to be just a, a goon or be, you know, a variety of things and see if they have a strong thing. Then they can put together a demo that they can then post on on uh, Facebook or IMDB Pro and they have to join IMDB Pro to, to post it and then they can send out cards with one of their self-take photos and a little bit if they've gotten any credits by now. Uh, but not to worry about just to send out the notice to variety of agents so they get a hold of Samuel French's The Agencies book and look at it to see what agencies now you know I got a guy who's paid me money to give him some stuff and the guy immediately con con contacted CAA or before he met me contacted CAA and William Morris and he's got no credits whatsoever I'm like what the hell is wrong with you man <laughs> don't you realize it you've got to start somewhere yes. where somebody is looking for somebody that looks like you or sounds like you or if you have these kinds of looks or whatever but I deal with reality you know reality if you don't deal with reality so, yeah, if you are, you should also be looking to make money at other things. Like if you're good with computers, learn that. If you're great with languages and want to be an interpreter, do that. If you want to go to law school, do that. But do, you know, you can always do, you can maybe acting just becomes fun. You know, right. something you do for fun. But it, not that I would, I have never told a person they can't. I will tell them what the difficulties are and do it, but pursue it in a smart way. Don't pursue it in a dumb way where you're taking advantage of right. You know what we yeah. think acting coaches should teach? We've always complained to each other, my daughter and I here doing these shows, that a lot of actors, now you're great, I'm not saying about you, you're great, but there's a lot of actors that come on the show that don't know how to fucking do an interview. And, and I think acting coaches should teach that because there's a certain way you can handle yourself when you're on the air and the public's listening to you, and some of them don't care about how they come across. <laughs> because they can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no lie. No lie. <laughs> yeah, no, look, you know, there are there are egos and people who are in panic areas, and I, for, you know, forgive them, you know. They, they're trying, and, you know, so, you know, if they're really dangerous shoot them and get rid of them <laughs> <laughs> it's so different now too like you said with the pandemic i mean i don't even know do you think hollywood's ever going to get back to where it was in, in full swing again it's so hard now i don't know i don't know maybe 
uh, somebody just called me about doing a bond convention a, a, a year from now, and I said maybe if there is a co, you know, they w- would want me to come to Vegas and uh-huh. do one of those autograph things and all that, which I've done uh, in England and I've done it in, you know, Canada and I've done it uh, you know, in the states and stuff like that. And it's fun, you know. I'm, I enjoy meeting a lot of people, and uh, I'm, you know, I, I I'm constantly studying people. That's yeah. my approach. So if I'm, you know, watching FDR struggle to get to a microphone, I become FDR at three years of age, and that's how you act. Just like Bushman told me, you know, mm-hmm. think Wait. my thought, do my move. You know? Well, you mentioned, but don't. Bushman can talk, okay? Right. Keep that. <laughs> Absolutely. No, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> it, uh, I was wondering, because you mentioned Bond again, and you're just like a salt of the earth, somebody I could talk to forever, and you you definitely had to have had some stories on the Bond set. Was there anything that happened between you and Sean Connery? Because I could just see you two getting <laughs> together and ripping the town up or something. Cause <laughs> well, that's your fantasy. <laughs> 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 no, reality is, look, when you are trying to become an actor, uh, uh, making enough money, I mean, I lived on the Lower East Side in New York and uh, struggled to uh, get this mm-hmm. job or that job, but posed at art classes all the time. Yeah. Uh, e- even when I was working, going at Northwestern, I was still doing the eight act at night in the eighth suit and then I would finish like at four in the morning and just go to the school of speech and take classes during the day and do Shakespeare and then eight o'clock at night I'd be back in uh, in uh, where the hell was it what's the name of that city north of Chicago um, almost in Indiana anyway it uh, um, it would be I would spend six days a week in my eighth suit while doing Shakespeare (laughs) <laughs> that was so different. I, I didn't let the ape ever become Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you. You talked I, about how you you critique actors, and I've got to ask your opinion because uh, we just recently rewatched the Walking Tall films, and you were in all three of them. The ones I call the legitimate ones. I don't call the one with the rock legitimate. That that to me wasn't a Walking Tall movie, but the ones that that were first made. Okay, the first one was Joe Don Baker, and then Bo Svensson. How do you compare Joe Don Baker and Bo Svensson in that same role, uh, played by two different men? Compare them. Well, uh, not to insult Bo, uh, he, he has acting talents, but he had a different script, mm-hmm. a different writer, uh, a different director, and different actors to work with. Yeah. So whatever he did, uh, I don't agree with the way it went. It, because I, I was... Um, when we did the first film, Joe Don Baker, who was terrific in the role and terrific to work with, uh, Buford Pusser was there all the time. Yeah. Right. He was on set with us. And Buford and I became very strong friends. And uh, I knew Buford. I knew what he was like. And I knew that his respect for women and his respect for um, law and his respect for the family was super important. But uh, I don't know why Joe Don wasn't going to be do the second film, but whatever reason, um, uh, Buford was, it was suggested that Buford might play himself in the second film. Right. And I did his screen test with him, and Buford, when he arrived, you know, and again, we had become strong friends, jokes and stuff, we had lots of fun, and he was a big tease, and he was super macho guy in the best possible way where it was a playful kind of thing and uh, but uh, I remember he arrived on the set and uh, we'd already done the release of uh, the first Walking Tall and the first Walking Tall was released at the big theater in Hollywood and uh, he um, there was a big party at uh, at uh, the big in the big restaurant there and then uh, another party afterwards and the audience was all deputy sheriffs and they roared and loved the thing and my stupidly I uh, some 
two guys from the foreign press approached me and said, you know, we should, should we want to nominate you for Best Supporting Actor, so stay in touch with us. And I didn't. Mm-hmm. Stupid me, I should have, because uh, I'm pretty damn good in that first film. Yeah. And uh, I, it's damn good acting, and uh, it, it's really a good part of the film. But Buford was there all the way through the film. We did the screen test. Now, Buford arrived, and they had they were had built at Paramount three full sets, and uh, maybe three and a half sets. And Buford uh, arrives, and he's glad to see me, and, and he looks at me, and he says, Bruce, I'm scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> kind of different. Yeah, and I said, yeah, that's a good place to start, Buford. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, what am I going to do? And then suddenly this old, goofy-type director, the guy who knows how to say, roll them, stop, cut. (laughs) That's it. That's that's the ability of directing he had. So he arrives, and he's before I get a chance to talk to Buford about doing the role, and he says, all right, let's read through the scenes, and I'm playing the deputy scenes with him and also playing a hijacker role um, that was later done uh, by a black guy in the film and uh, so I'm we Buford and I read through it and Buford is terrible really mm. oh. <laughs> and the director stands in front of us and wobbles from one foot to the other and goes yeah um uh well uh Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) suddenly he whirls on foot (laughs) and spins away yelling back over his shoulder let me know when it's lighted (laughs) he was afraid to say too much because he probably had his big stick with him so you know no that, that big stick thing is the thing that went really wrong really yeah definitely Buford didn't used the big stick but once in his whole life and that was not part of Buford Buford was an entirely different kind of man and that's where the movie went wrong well anyway Buford and I were left alone and Buford looks at me and he says I was terrible wasn't I I said yep (laughs) (laughs) but you're a good sheriff you're a good sheriff (laughs) what am I going to do I said Buford listen to me now when you were on patrol, you'd be in your car, and you'd be noticing, and you might be driving, and you'd notice a car that you thought you should <coughs> check up. And you'd look at the license plate and call in the license plate to see if there was anything out on it. Mm-hmm. And then when you decided to stop the car, you'd turn your lights on and see how he reacted. And then when he stopped, you would pull over to the side a bit so your own car would block you from any oncoming traffic hitting you and you would approach the back of his car looking through the back windows see if there was anyone back there you'd look over his shoulder to see if there was anyone in the driver's seat you'd look over his shoulder to see if you could see any weapons and then when he, you, he, you got him to get out of the car you'd wash his hands you talk to him and see how he answered you and see what he looked like when he responded. He says, yeah, I do all those things. I said, well, that's how you act. He went, oh, okay. And that's, a, that's an acting lesson right there. Mm-hmm. Well, that's unfortunately, he, it, it never happened, you know, like they portrayed in, in the next movie, that, that he was in no, a wait, so-called... Wait a, minute, wait a minute. It did happen. He was great in the in the... In in the in the stuff that we shot, and he was going to be terrific. Yeah. So well, that what happened. Was, yeah. Well, what happened was the accident. That's what I was getting at. But yeah. Oh, but it wasn't. It wasn't an accident. It was a murder. There we go. That's, that's what, what I we, wanted that's to what hear. We, were trying to get we don't. At. We don't. In no way do we believe it was an accident. No, no. it was not an accident. No, his daughter told me and described the thing. I mean, when I would be having lunch with Buford, I remember one time we're with this very cute girl with him and Buford was wearing very tight clothing and I said Buford I know that you're under threat and that anyone could come at you anyway I'm trying to look at you and see where the hell your gun is mm-hmm. he says oh it's right here I said where and he reached down and tapped her purse 
<laughs> his gun was in his purse. But Buford was all, even when he came to L.A., he had to, everyone had to be let know that he was under threat. Yeah. And uh, so when I, you know, after the tragedy of his death, I was very upset. And, yeah. Uh, I still will always be. It would, Buford would have been terrific in the thing. Yeah. I mean, Joe Don was terrific in the first one. Buford would have been terrific in the thing. Were you ever but, worried about uh, being threatened or whatever? Because you guys part of it telling the story well uh, I don't know I I I've been I know how to I know when I'm in danger yeah and I know how I know that when Crispin was a little kid um, my wife and I were I was still I was still the struggling actor trying to pay my huge $99 a month mortgage and uh, um $99 a month more <laughs> I still own that house and I rent if you if you don't have property get some if you can't afford a house start buying graveyard plots they go up in value too that's yeah, true that is yes. true yeah yeah so anyway uh, I remember we used to like you know we were tight on money and we would like um uh, look for events to go through and I remember there was a Will Gear, terrific old time actor oh, yeah. who started his Shakespeare thing out in uh, in uh, uh, the hills over there and uh, uh, I uh, so we were going to go to that where Shakespeare reading and we got there and I parked our, my old Volkswagen and Betty had gotten out with Crispin and uh, when I turned around she was gone, and Chris was standing alone right next to this guy, almost leaning on his leg. And the guy was gesticulating and making all kinds of moves and stuff. And like he were, and there were a couple, three guys sitting on a picnic bench, a broken down picnic bench, uh, you know, like three, four guys actually, uh, yelling, in, That a way to go, Charlie! That a way to go, Charlie! And he's waving his arms, and I knew I had to go and get my kid. But one of the things you do if you're in a, a gang situation, I realized it was a gang immediately, that you don't make eye contact. So I slid over to over this guy, Charlie, and I slid my arm down and scooped up Crispin, who was like, a, you know, like three years old, maybe. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> then uh, moved away from him and... Charlie threw himself back on a pile of garbage and started rolling around on it. And everyone was laughing and stuff because I looked to see if, well, was this, did I just, uh, you know, start a, a switch here? Would I, you know, so I was just checking out of the corner. I didn't look, but I checked out. So I went, okay, this is fine. I'll get past, go past this and go down these stairs to the theater where the readings would be and uh, about eight more guys come up the stairs again part of this same mob of guys and again you avert your eyes and you get past them you make no contact with them then I got down to the bottom and uh, looked up this, and I said to my wife didn't you see those guys she said what guys and I went oh my god because you know the hippies were around then and it was you know who the Charlie was don't you Mm. Charlie Manson. Oh my. Really? Oh my. Wow. Charlie Manson. And uh, he was there. And uh, he he was, Crispin was leaning against his leg. Oh my God. And Charlie was charming. I could see how charming he was and how people were enjoying him and all that stuff. But I looked up to see if uh, any of those guys, I had other, a couple other Manson events, but... Uh, um. Yeah, yeah, that was the change. It was the end of the hippies were kind right. of adorable. Well, I'm glad that turned out okay. Wow. Well, I'm a I'm a guy who deals with reality. Yeah. So you know, when you asked if I was ever worried about Buford, you know, enemies coming at me and telling the story, you know, it doesn't matter. They they didn't it, it didn't carry that far and. Uh, Lots of politicians and stuff like that around. Well, what happened? 
second film was, I remember, you know, uh, Duana told me, and I knew Duana, you know, the real Buford daughter, and mm-hmm. she told me about his death and how it was a truck had squirved and shoved him off the road, and uh, and she was she arrived with with his turned over car and the two truck drivers standing there looking at him underneath the car, and uh, she said, "Help me get him out." And I said, "Not on your life, lady." And she pulled Buford out herself and mm-hmm. held him. Uh, with his head in her lap and he looked up at her and said her name Duana 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 and died Mm. and then she looked on the road and could see where the tires were and how it had caused Buford car to be turned over I I can't believe that this has never been solved I mean everybody just thought it was an accident left it alone and it remains unsolved they they didn't want to solve it they wanted to get away from it they just wanted to pass it off I gotta ask you a lighthearted question we check IMDB and sometimes it's true sometimes it's not did you have an uncredited role in Frankenstein meets a space monster well I I have a credited role in that (laughs) (laughs) I played a guy with uh, pointy ears, and uh, damn it, pointy ears caused you to go to bald, so I was bald. <laughs> <laughs> I was a pointy ear bald guy, but I also doubled into the ape suit, or it was kind of the monster suit, so I was used to being in suits. I did, there was somebody else that did it too, but I, uh, they they needed me to do it one, one or two times. So. Yeah, James. It was just uh, in one of those, one of those, you know, New York events where you're, you get a like a, a five day job, yeah. and uh, you pay, you pay your rent for five weeks, you know, or well, five it, months. Some people thinks it was a bad movie, but it had people like James Karen in it, right? Yeah, I, I, it was a bad movie, but so <laughs> what? <It> was- <laughs> well, you have certainly done the big films too. It had to be fun working with Jack Nicholson in Chinatown. Very much. Jack was great. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Polanski was great too. Polanski uh, and I used to play chess together, and Jack used to give it our games. And uh, yeah, I had a the way to all of these films goes up a strange kind of thing. You never know how lucky you can be as a as an as a tough actor back in those days. You had to go and push yourself into offices. I would go into offices and leave my pictures and try to make get interviews and meet casting directors. And you know, I was with William Morris, but I finally had to leave William Morris and go to a smaller agency because William Morris was waiting for the big kill. Mm-hmm. I needed small kills to keep alive. Right. So I went with a smaller agency just to get jobs, and I did lots of films. I've done oh, you know, well over a hundred films and over a hundred plays. And, probably close to a hundred television shows and uh, um, you just you know again the working class mentality you have to make money and uh, so eventually somebody at William Morris asked me to come back but I, I didn't go back and in fact I had I haven't had an agent for 20 mm-hmm. years now people just kept contacting <clears throat> me and finding me without an agent because I got tired of agency sending me for parts that I didn't want to do and then getting money parts of the money that I did want to do that I'd really gotten on my own so anyway maybe I want an agent again though if never know an agent, you know I might be ready again but yeah. I'm 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 always a person with lots of projects I might be writing a book on acting I might be writing um, a um, I've got a couple of screenplays that I've written I've got one that be very animated good. and I've got a script I'm I'm a very creative guy because it's part of being alive is working on something if you're not working on anything you know i work with my daughter here on the show and i've got to find out because you know we were talking a little bit about your son crispin who i am a, a major fan of i want to thank you for having sex and bringing crispin into the world by the way i told everybody i would jokingly say that but what's it like working for How crispin dare you talk about my sex life <laughs> You produced some great things, including Crispin Glover. But I want to find out, okay, uh, you were in uh, two of his films. 
one that I guess is still not released, but I saw the one which is more of like an art film type, I guess you could describe. But what's it like with uh, Crispin uh, at the directing helm and it's Crispin's film and you're working for your son? What's that like? Great. Yeah. He's Great. a pro. He's smart. You know, we we would have some disagreements, but we'd work it out. It was fine. He wrote a script. I criticized it. He yelled it. <laughs> His mother read the script. She criticized it. He didn't yell at her. Oh. <laughs> there you go. She'd have beat the hell out of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I he un- was way too tough. <laughs> I, under- I understand that the you guys did a project that's still being worked on, right? Like, you guys started it like six years ago, right? Yeah. We did it very swiftly. It only took us six years. <laughs> Well, he, he shot it in the Czech Republic. Um, uh, I eventually the script, uh, the criticism worked, and I was able to add things to the script. So I do have a, a minor uh, script edition mm-hmm. credit, and uh, I basically play four characters in the thing, and three of them are the older version of three of Christian's char- characters. Mm-hmm. Christian, uh, I always told Christian about. Um, if you want reality and you want safety, there's one very interesting thing which has real part of its name, mm-hmm. real estate. And he owns a house in Silver Lake, which he aired d and B is out. He's got a girlfriend there who's still running the thing, even though Christmas locked down in the Czech Republic right now. Still working on our film. And uh, I had to make dozens of trips to Europe I also did a Polish film where I acted in Polish. Jak się masz, dupa? You know what I just said? <laughs> no, no I, I have no idea. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to act in Polish, so uh, I went to Warsaw like six times, and then uh, I've, uh, I, I must have made ten trips to the Czech Republic because we shot it in sections. And um, well, you're of uh, Czech descent too, right? I mean, you've got that in your blood. Well, it, 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 my great grandmother, oh no, my grandmother on my father's side was from Czech. Mm-hmm. My father was from English. My mother was Swedish, and from all Swedish blood. So I'm half Swedish, a quarter English, and a quarter Czech. Mm. And. Uh, Crispin, when he was looking for a place, you know, he has has a place in Silver Lake. He was looking for a place in Europe and, you know, Spain and all of that. And then he found the Czech Republic, which was a good find because their tax ratio was good. He bought a 20-acre estate like over 15 years ago. I, You know, I, I looked it up to see what it looked like. And my God, it's 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 beautiful. It's enormous. Yes. It's yeah. Gorgeous. And peacocks and there are he doesn't have pictures there of the stables uh, there were two stables that uh, we built sound stages in and uh, there's also another section with another kitchen and the house itself that he lives in is I guess it was originally 54 room mansion you know, well obvi- obviously you paid him a very good allowance throughout <laughs> the years <laughs> yeah Kind of, yeah. Saw <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah, no, I, I told him, you know, obviously he's made more money now in the business than I have because back in my days they were cheap on actors. Yeah, it's know, true. They didn't work. pay as much, yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't care, you know. I mean, I'm fine. I'm pretty smart about money and uh, I don't need to work ever again if I don't want to. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, but I'll, I'll work if somebody comes up. There are a couple of people that say I'm going to be in their film, but I haven't, you know, I haven't seen any contracts yet or any reason to work. I would work in a film if it's a really good part. I won't work if it's just junk. You know? Right. Well, I, I'll yeah. tell you, I want to throw a plug in for my friend Steve Carver, uh, who has a great book Steve out. Is great. I wish Steve would go back to directing. I'd work with him no matter what. You know, check him out because th- they've got a little western they're wanting to make. They what? They've got a Western. Steve is working on a Western. He's trying to get out, or at least working Where out. Where they want to make it. I don't know if they've shot anything or 
how far they are, but he's wanting to do a Western film. Well, yeah, I guess, you know, that'd be fine. Uh, you know, uh, forget Westerns. Oh, who needs another Western? God shit. <laughs> <laughs> They kind of come back for a while, then they go away. Yeah. But how much fun was it doing the the photo shoot? First of all, who's that lovely lady that's in the photo with you? From Western Portraits, from Steve's book. Which 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 photo? Um, there was a photo that you did for Steve's book, Western Portraits, where you're kind of like in a saloon outfit, and you have a, a lovely saloon girl kind of sitting at your feet. Sitting at my feet. Oh. That. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that that was Steve Carver's photo. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, she was just somebody. That, when when he was going to do, Steve approached me and wanted to do, put me in the western because I've done a, quite a few westerns, and um, but it's not the main thing I've done. A lot of people think that you know they read that book and they think that's all I've done. No, no. I've done yeah. eighty other things that weren't westerns. Right, but. Um, Steve, um, offered, and I, he sent me some examples of stuff, and there were all these rough-looking cobbles, and I said, Steve, what I want to do is I want to be a successful owner of a saloon, and I want two pretty women hanging on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So I contacted two pretty women that were students of mine, and neither of them were willing or had the space or time to do it. And uh, finally, I, 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 uh, Steve came up with that woman that, at my feet, and then I came up with another woman who was actually a guy who had worked on Christmas films, and there, a lot of times when we were working in Czech Republic on this, one of the stages, I'd look over and see this long-haired woman over there, and, went, and then he turned, and I realized it was this guy. <laughs> 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 and I thought... Well, let's put him in the photo, and we'll just photo him from the rear, because from a corner. So there were some photos that Steve took <laughs> of the, my <clears throat> pal with with his mustache hidden by his hair hanging oh. down. But oh. anyway, he was he was not in the final photo. <laughs> I was going to say I never saw that one. Okay, that's <laughs> no. Steve pretends that he didn't do it. No. <laughs> but but you look very good in the photo, and and. Uh, yeah, I would like to have her at my feet too. That was she was nice looking. She was what? She was nice looking. I wouldn't mind having her at my feet. Well, I offered her to you know she should suggest I suggest that she should try out acting because she was good looking, mm -hmm. but she totally turned me down. Um, yeah. I went, oh, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we go, uh, last thing we wanted to talk about was: can you tell us? Can you tell us anything about the art book that you're working on? I mean, how far along are you, or is it kind of one of those things where you? It's because you know it's a, it's a living, breathing project. So who knows how long it'll take? Well, I've got a hundred photos uh, of of drawings and things like that. I'm I will continue painting. Uh, I've sold paintings for as much as. Well, I won't tell the price because then the IRS will catch me. Yes, don't um, do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I've sold paintings over the years, but I'm, I don't want to sell now until after I get a book out. And then I, I want to get the book out. I've got, uh, I've got to get my computer fixed. I've got to get a different computer. Kristen may publish it for me. Um, did you say you were into publishing? Uh, well, not really. We write for a national magazine, but we don't publish our own books. I know somebody that does publish books. I can get you in touch with. Right. Well, I think we'll you're better think off to go. It. You're better off to go with your son, though. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we'll do it in China, and once I've got it, then yeah. then I want to get a a somebody who distributes paintings, and then I want to start selling my paintings for what they're worth, like mm -hmm. you know, two hundred thousand dollars a piece. Of the meekly prices that have gotten yeah. in the past. So, uh, I, I, I can do 12. I did one 12 foot long painting. I've got a bunch of 12 foot long mm -hmm. canvases. Wow. And I will do them. So, if somebody out there wants me to do a 12 foot long canvas for them, tell them to get in contact with me and I'll give them a fairly 
awful price. Mm -hmm. and, and, and casting directors can contact you unless it's a Western because you don't want to do a Western, <laughs> right? No, I, I love horses. They're fun. I mean, I love doing Western. I mean, look, you take Western. What are Western? You take the dumbest animal in the world, you put them <laughs> on, on top of the second dumbest animal, and the second dumbest animal is hurting the third dumbest animal. So... I'm willing to be the dumbest animal on on the planet, riding on top of that lovely smart horse. <laughs> All right. Well, no, I liked it. Yeah. Well, hopefully we get back into making films and doing things, and this stupid pandemic ever gets over with. Uh, you know, it's all according to how the election turns out, I guess. Well, if we don't get rid of the guy, I think I'm going to move back to Sweden. I don't know. Or, or if if we don't get rid of the guy, I say that we all move to the Czech Republic and yeah. just go back over there. There you go. Maybe Czech seem to be fairly smart about it all. Right. But I hope there will be enough undumb people who will vote that creep out because he's a criminal, total mm -hmm. criminal. I mean, he's and the disgusting stuff and lack of respect for women. A Bo uh, a Bo Bu Buford fan. Uh, told me that, you know, he's going to vote for Trump, yeah. Putin. And <laughs> I said, Bo Buford would have, Buford would have killed that yeah. Trump. He would have beat the crap out of him. Yeah. Not only for what he said, but the way he's treated women. Right. Buford had a high respect for women. And uh, like I said, we were one time at a lunch and some drunk was wandering past and put his hand on the woman's shoulder that was sitting at the table with us uh, to catch his balance and and didn't notice that Buford started to rise up to go after him and the woman reached up and said, no, Buford, no, it's okay. Buford would have whipped him just for touching her shoulder. Right. Yeah. And that was the kind of guy Buford was. He was a protector of the women. real deal. And, yeah, a real things in real life so you know and uh well the, the thing about trump that really bothered me is when he made fun of the reporter that had disabilities now i i know your son took somebody with disabilities and gave him a starring role in a movie and and crispin really respects people with disabilities i don't think that went too well with your son when trump did that either i doubt as do i those people were fun to be with they yeah. i i had good times with them I was around this head. I have a credit as a grave digger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always yeah. that. You know, I wouldn't suggest you go back to that. That's pretty hard work. But yeah. Well, one last time, but, you know, I want to give my phone number yes, again. Yes. Absolutely. Anyone really wants to find out anything about my mm -hmm. art, but they have to leave a solid message. It's 310 310 Wait a minute. Three three one zero three nine eight two five three nine. I I I forget that I I've got another phone number that I use, but I've gotta get I've gotta get my my you know, my iPhone working again and I've gotta get a new computer so I can finish my art book. And yeah. and you're you're on Facebook now. You uh I'm waiting for you to accept my friend request. You didn't accept it yet. You need to accept it. What's that? On Facebook, yeah. I have about I don't know a thousand requests there, so I don't yeah. get to all. <laughs> and I, I usually try to get to them and see who they are. Yeah. Because I I have space for maybe another seven hundred people or five hundred people, but you know some people I would have to start erasing to in order to let them in. Well, well, you got you got to let me in, Bruce. I know your son. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, are you a, aren't you a Facebook friend? Uh, we're not yet. We sent you a request, but we're not, I don't think we're approved yet. Yeah. We're waiting until you oh, get really? to that. Yeah. Yeah. Send it again, and I'll know what the hell I'm, who I'm letting in. Okay. Right. But, yeah, you can look at my Facebook and see, you can see some artwork, and mm -hmm. you can see lots of stuff that I say about acting and about politics right now a lot. Yes. You know, about yeah. Yeah. Thieves and monsters, and how please people. If you haven't voted yet, go out there and get the criminal out. If you're Republican, save your party. Yeah. He's now holding the Republican Party prisoner. 
he will creep out the Republican Party. There were great Republicans. Lincoln was a Republican. Right. Teddy Roosevelt right. was a Republican. There could be good Republicans in the future, but not if that creep is in, um, in control of you. He's got you all enslaved. Well, it's Just like... We had John Savage on, actor John Savage, and he's a Republican, and he said Trump does not represent the Republican Party for Yeah, him. he said don't hold that against me. Yeah, John is a pal. You know, I, I know him. Yeah. We enjoyed Jim John, and his uh, his lady that uh, lives with him, I, I don't know if they're married. She used to take acting lessons with me. She's a oh. lovely, sweet. And, uh, but John is terrific, a terrific actor. And, yeah, uh, yeah he's... You know, my father was a Republican. My wife was registered as a Republican, but I always managed to get her to vote the way I wanted. Her to vote. <laughs> <laughs> so, you think you'll ever get to do the acting class in person again? I don't know. I would. I could do conventions. I could do a convention with. Uh, I've done them before with a hundred people, where I do classes of a hundred people, and it's called saying your name. Yeah. And I. People in the audience say their name, and then I might bring some of them up on stage. So I, I can give a lecture that would be two hours long, but people would have to offer me a substantial amount of money, and then I could do autograph signing afterwards. Yeah. Right. But not until COVID is done and buried, and we don't have COVID, not COVID 20 and 21 coming. That's true. Well, you can't go there now, but you should... Uh, show up uh, a friend of ours who was in the movies at one time did a lot of the beach party films her name is Bobby Shaw she teaches acting too they would love to have you show up and talk to the kids well does she was she successful as an actor in a roundabout way uh, she did five or six beach party films and she's acted with David Carradine and people like that she didn't really pursue it after the 60s so yeah well, you know, look, everyone has their level, and they can reach a certain level. And unfortunately, there, you know, there are these big disciplines. Like I, you know, I studied psychology a lot, and you know, I mean, I, I, I don't agree with the method. I don't agree. The le the method is limiting. It's making you, you know, there are great people who give the method credit, but it's because of their own talent. It wasn't the method that made them good. It was the fact that they went on to their own instincts. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if you go with your own instincts, you're going to be good. And that's where, you know, like I didn't push my acting at Crispin. Um, I let him go to acting classes because, you know, it was good for him socially to go to acting classes. I, I only would talk to him about acting when he asked me specifically about something. I remember like Nick Cage was his best buddy. And Nick used to be at our house all the time. Nick would ask me advice, but he would... I, I shouldn't say that. Nick would beat me up. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I loved him. He was a great yeah. kid. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, Chris Walken was... I, I did a play uh, on Broadway that I had... I was understudy from Robert Preston. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a part in the play, but I was there with the producers and directors, and I saw this young guy was Chris Walken, and I saw how talented he was, but I could see that the producer, director, and writer were thinking of firing him. Mm -hmm. So I pulled him aside, and I didn't teach him anything about acting. I just told him to stop worrying about these guys. And so we would meet after every every scene that he did over in the side lobby, and, you know, and I'd say, yeah, just meet and we'll talk a little bit. And then uh, after about two weeks of that, he says, I think I've got it. I think you do. And he did. And, you know, he's He's one guy I quote because he did say to Crispin when they worked on him, your dad helped me a great deal in my early days in New York. And, uh, well, fantastic. I was a friend of his, and he was a friend of mine, a terrific, terrific guy, married to a very beautiful woman, a much different person than any of you would know, and uh, actually a tough dude. He was mm -hmm. pretty tough. And, uh, I backed him up one time when somebody crossed him one time, and uh, he had the guy begging for mercy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I guess Crispin's got a new movie out. I can't think of the name. I don't know if you know it either, but i got to check that out. I, well, I, there, he's got some offers right now, but, you know, he's in that American God series. Of yeah. Course. yeah, of course. He has an interesting look on, on acting. Cause 
he, he talks about how he gets very offbeat roles offered to him all the time, and he's never going to get to play like the leading man and stuff, but that's okay, because he uses those movies to pay for what he does in his films, which is a great way of doing right. it. Yeah. yeah. That's a great way of doing it. Well, well, well he's done terrific work, and he, you know, he's working on film, which is rare yes, now. Yes, it is. is. At his estate in the Czech Republic, he got people working on it, and uh, so he's still working on our film. Hopefully, it'll be done sometime before the pandemic is over with. Right. Uh, before, or as soon as the pandemic is over with, I hope it's ready. Yeah. If, if I ever but, want an interesting interview, and we've had him on three times, all I have to do is mention the word censorship, and he goes off because he hates censorship. <laughs> Well, he's a tough dude, and you know, you know, he's he's a lovely, lovely guy, and uh, women love him. And certain way, there's a certain innocence about him still. And, yeah. uh, I still call him my boy. And, uh, uh, he is. He's my boy, and, and I'm very proud. Oh, of there's him. no doubt about being your boy. You two look so much alike; it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, his mother had similar features to mine too. She wow. Was also a mixture of, uh, I don't know, areas uh, of around Germany and that kind of area. So, well, it's yeah, been great yeah, talking to you, yeah. and happy Halloween, and uh, like you said, everybody needs to vote. <clears throat> hey, thank Yes, both of you, love you both. Pleasure, any time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. You have my phone number, so keep in touch. And uh, once again, for our listeners, why don't you go ahead and give them the number again that they can call if they're interested in possibly taking an acting class with you. 310-398-2539. Perfect, perfect. And a clear message. Clear message. Yes. Thank you again so much, Bruce, for hanging out with us. And uh, we will keep in touch. In the meantime, have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, my dear. All right. Later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.